So we were talking about entity relationship diagrams. Um, this is a great article I'll throw in our Zoom chat. And if someone can maybe like move it into our, our Slack, that would be appreciated. And Lucidchart is a pretty cool tool for this as well. Um, and I, I totally agree with Zainab, like making actual entity relation, like formal entity relationship diagrams is probably overkill. Um, that said, if you find it helpful, then go for it. I definitely think some sort of diagramming and planning phase is essential for, for designing um, like a database. Even the apparently simple databases that we're designing for uh, our exercises and things right now. And you can kind of see what's going on here. Each of these entities basically maps to a table and represents a table. An entity is another one of those words, like whether it's like record or table or class is a little more specific, but there are a lot of words for a collection of data that's related to each other. Um, and then entity relationship diagram, there, there are just then some formal rules about, and this is kind of a cool article because it does go through the history of it. Um, it goes through some formal rules like Honestly, most of this stuff about entity categories, I probably learned a little bit about it once and then forgot all about it. Um, really, the most relevant part is this part of the diagram where it talks about the different kinds of relationships of a one to one relationship, a one to many relationship, a many to many relationship. And we'll talk about this more today. I think we'll spend a good amount of time on this. But um, just as a very quick example, like one movie theater has many screens or showing rooms. So if we have a showing rooms table um, and maybe our database is keeping track of like multiple theater locations or a better example from yesterday would be one screening room has many seats. And maybe we have a database table for an individual seat to record like if that seat has been bought or not. So there would be a one-to-many relationship between uh, a screening room and, and theater seats, and then a many-to-one, I always have trouble saying it the other way, but like many seats belong to one screening room, one screening room can have many seats. And because when we're figuring out the relationships between the tables in our database, that's kind of the most important part. This is the part of the diagram that that's most useful. But again, the, you can get pretty far with this informally. I am pretty excited to try this out this. So we may uh, try try some of this today. But so we've got a couple good things I think that we want to go over today. And let me go ahead and get that ball rolling. And can people see my screen okay right now? Uh, should I bump up the font size on this? Yeah. Good. Okay. Cool. I'm going to make it a bit bigger just to. Just to do it. I do apologize. This laptop might be going a little slow. Review, select queries, joins. Uh, sounds like particularly like looking over queries yesterday. And this was pretty much um, my list of things to review as well. Um, you know, I wanted to ask, what does what does CRUD stand for? That's that's on my review list. Um, what does CRUD stand for? Ooh, I got create. this one. Uh, create, read, update, delete. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Um, 
yeah, and those are the main things that we do with the database. Um, and similarly, also on my review list is why do we call Postgres a relational database again? What's what's the word relational they're referring to? Similar IDs or equal IDs. Say that again, Jim. I'm sorry. Similar IDs between tables. You are Similar correct in terms of how we implement those relationships. Um, at a higher level, it is the idea of modeling our data in terms of the relationships between tables or between entities or, or between things. Like a file system, you could call a file system a database, but it's certainly not relational. It's maybe hierarchical. Um, there's a hierarchy in the file system. There are things that are higher in the tree and lower in the tree. Um, Another cool thing about a relational database is unlike a file system, we don't have to really know where things live. We don't know where in the hard drive, the information about our movie theater lives. We don't need to know its address and memory. We do need to know its ID if we want to query it by ID, but there are a lot of ways to get that data. And we really just tell the database like what we want in a very specific fashion and the database knows where it is and, and goes and gets it for us. Um, really, I think the other thing I want, the other things I wanted to mention, um, I know the setup yesterday was a bit of a, a journey, which is part of the journey of, of programming. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of you probably did something with an environment variable named path. And that one's ridiculously huge. Um, but does that ring a bell to anyone? Yeah. So we've talked about this path environment variable and, and the shell environment a little, but not a lot. And I just wanted to quickly touch on that to give us a little more context too, especially because we're running this PSQL program from the command line. Um, so anyone maybe want to share like their their two cents on like what is this path variable? For items in that list, the operating system, when you're trying to find a command, it will start to search through there. If the location of that program is in one of those locations, it will find it and execute the application. Yeah, that's a great explanation, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, as you can see, my path variable is extremely huge. And stepping back a little bit, we're, um, and the path is very specific to the, the shell environment too. And with, with a Mac, because we're running Linux, like sort of the shell environment does represent the operating system pretty well. But really the, the path is about our shell program. This one is high term, well, the terminal program that we're running. Um, that, that lets us interact with the file system and, and with the operating system. Um, and every time you start the terminal of the shell, it starts what's called a new session. Um, back in the day, you had to log in. We, we don't really have to do this right now because of the way our computer is set up. And the shell environment needs to know where things are. Um, like if the which command I've demonstrated a bit, and it tells us the path, the folders and directories that this psql program lives in. And the way the which command finds that out is exactly like you're saying, Jim, it looks at this extremely long string. If you look, each path is separated by a, a colon. And somewhere in here is, here we go, applications slash Postgres slash app. Um, Adam, I have an addition to that also. Yeah. The, the benefit it serves is if you don't know where your application is at and it's not in the path, you won't, it's not easy to run it. But if you, if it's not in the path and you know where it's at, you have to either visit the explicit directory to complete that, the start of that application. Say that one more time, please. You have to visit that directory. You have to visit that folder location so as to execute the application. That's an excellent point. You're absolutely right. Like if I wanted to, I could go to applications, which is a directory, 
And if I look in here, somewhere among here, and I'll use is the Postgres application right here. And another way to run something from the command line is you pass the name of the program that you want to run and the path to get to it. Um, now that I did that, I'm actually not sure how to exit postgres.app because I didn't really want to. I think I'm gonna just have to, have to kill the terminal and open a new one because I wanted psql. I'm not sure exactly what postgres.app does. But yeah, Jim, you're, you're totally spot on. Um, and so this is all just a bit of prelude to remind us that then when I run this psql program on the command line, this is a program that we're running in, in, in the shell environment and a little bit about what that is and what some of the past stuff that we were doing is. Um, and now is probably a good point to start doing some reviews of um, creating a database schema and doing some select queries. And then I think we'll get to some joins. And I know that we were talking about looking at things from one of the assignments um, yesterday. Was there a select query? Which assignment from yesterday is going to have some good queries for us to look at? Which one uh, should we start with? The last one. OK, people feel good about the last one? Let's do it. And now I have to go and grab the last one. Um, and Bear with me while I do that. And probably actually what will be great is we can just start building it and running it and talking about stuff. Oh, Jason, beautiful, thank you. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and copy that link. That's what I should have asked someone to do. That, that was much smarter. Um, I probably do need to grab the school database. That would certainly help. But let's go ahead, let's quickly construct the school database. And that can be kind of a good review too before we start doing this warm up. Um, so let me go ahead and create an SQL file and then I'll just name it schema and we'll build our school database and then we'll create it in Postgres and then we'll run it. Um, oh, and Zainab, thank you. And I'll pull that up. And I might look at it as a reference, but I think like as a class, we we got this. Um, create table students, drop table if exists. Yep. Are we looking at, did we have anything other than students in this database? Um, there's a schema up above. So if you scroll up. Um, so the schema only provided the, the students. I think we had, they had to add Got it. Um, addresses and classes. Yeah, let's do it. Address, class, and enrollment. Let's do it. Let's build our schema. And then we'll run it and then we'll make some queries. And Zainab, thank you so much. And I'll kick it off with, um, I'll close the terminal for the moment. So we've got the students table. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll, I'll probably use, actually, let's try Sam. Let's try your visual tool. Um, I can't just put SQL in here, can I? Okay, we can import. Let's see what happens. Way too many files here. I apologize. Okay, that's awesome. We've got a student's table. 
So we can build this out, we'll import the file and then we can see the whole thing in here, which will be great. So I, I heard something about like, what were the other two tables that we want here? Addresses is one of them. Why am I putting this drop table if exists statement here? So that if you uh, feed the schema back into uh, the command line, it will replace, it'll, it'll delete the old table, replace it with the new table. So cover any errors. Yeah, yeah. It's not, there are better ways of managing like modifying a schema, but basically this file is like our source of truth. So if I'm using this file to build a new database schema and I need to like just make a change to the database, it's just easier rather than trying to modify an existing table, just get rid of it and start from scratch. Um, and what fields do we want here for addresses? We probably need zip code, right? Um, what did what did someone do as a zip code? Oh, there, there's a seed file with with all of the um, inputs. Yeah, and if you don't match it, then uh, you'll have problems with the seed file later as I discovered yesterday. Got it. Okay, so maybe it's easier than, yeah, that's a good call. I appreciate that. Rather than soliciting, we should just, so this looks like inputs, ID, line one, city, state, zip code. I put a little snippet in uh, chat. Not the, obviously what we need to label them for the input, but. In the, in the readme, you should see how the table, uh, uh, I don't know. You gotta check the readme to, to see how the table should look like. Thank you. That might be the easiest way then. Zach also just put it in in the chat. Um, that would make it go way faster. Thank you guys. Yeah, I think that's a good way to do it. I should have just asked someone to maybe Slack me the file, but this is gonna work. Thank you. Now I just need to get my Vim to not complain. I got a quick question uh, that I was kind of curious about. Are we always going to do the var char 255 or is it just like, you know, you only want four, so you'd put four um, cap? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Uh, 255, so 255 is really saying like 256 characters, which is one of those powers of eight, which is like, uh, cause every, or powers of two rather, cause everything in the computer is based off of powers of two. So we're looking at, I, I don't know, like a byte or, or a couple bytes or something like that. So that's kind of why it's a standard number. Um, Honestly, with Postgres, sometimes I will just use the text field because it's simpler and faster. Um, if you know that you want, like an email is a great example of something where maybe that would be varchar 20 because we are not expecting and we probably don't want like an incredibly long email. Um, and so then there could be other cases like in theory, a zip code is a specific number of characters, a license plate actually would be a good example, right? Of a varchar that is maybe a smaller number of characters. Um, what ends up happening on a practical level is that you always add a lot of padding in terms of like the size of things, because they're always special cases and you want, um, it's you don't want to have to modify the schema if you don't have to. So I I'm not sure. Where, yeah, please. I would say though a caveat of just having like text fields or like very large fields when you know you only need a little bit of data is that you're wasting um, space, like resource space, when you have like a large, large application that has like millions of rows or something like that. 
Um, so in in our cases, like for, for the class, I think it would be fine to, to do this. Um, but if you're working on an application later when you're working, um, you, you might have to be weary of how much space you're giving things because if you're, if you have like a bunch of text fields and you only need like a little tiny bit of space for each one, um, each row is taking up like a lot of space when you actually just need like a little bit of space. So it might, it might cost more to save your data in a database that is built on a larger scale versus a smaller scale. Um, so that might, yeah, that's just something that you might have to think about when you're um, at the job. Yeah, you, that is a really good point. And I shouldn't have glossed over that, um, mainly because when I've been doing stuff professionally, it's either been building a small project from scratch where we didn't have to care about that with our database because we weren't going to be getting large amounts of data, or I was making changes to an existing like application where I wasn't often like changing like core SQL tables. Um, that's something that I hadn't had to think about as much, but you're, you're totally right. Yeah, thank you, Zainab. Yeah, I should not have, have glossed over that. Um, and thank you for your patience, folks. I think we've got our schema. And what is great is that we can test it out now and we can just import this file and let's see what our, our database looks like. So this is awesome. This table one table looks like that's their default. So let's see if we can delete that. That's hard to make it a bit bigger, but. Um, oh yeah, I'm catching up on the chat. Sam, thank you. Exactly. That is that is the next step. We're going to throw this in, in PSQL. Um, it does look like I accidentally copied the student's table twice. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete one of these and then update my schema. And that's just the dangers of copying things. Just so that I'm I'm tracking, this is just so that you can visually show us, right? You're not going to be like, this is just for are two cents kind of teaching us this or is this something that we're going to this draw sql something we're going to be using this is just a visual tool okay okay awesome i was just making sure i was like oh, i did, i'd never seen this so i was i was just double checking no no that's a really good point i have never seen this before either um i i think sam found this and it it looks quite cool so i was just like let's use it um as, as a visual aid, because it's a bit better than a, a spreadsheet. Um, and it looks like we're actually good. It's, it's from me importing the file twice. And now I think we're ready to create the database. And I am going to use iTerm because it is a little easier for me to do like terminal work here than the VS Code terminal. I kind of prefer it. So I navigated to the directory where our schema lived. I'm using the PWD and LS commands to confirm I navigated to where I think I did. Um, and I do have to create the database. Um, so I'm just going to log into PSQL really quickly. Um, in fact, I might even open, well, I don't need to worry about two tabs here, but uh, create database school. And it does not like that because I have a queue in there. And now if I use the forward slash L command, that lists all the different databases. Looks like we've got the school database, which is great. Uh, forward slash Q will quit PSQL. Um, and now I'm going to very carefully follow Sam's guide code.
to create our database. So this is actually really good to talk about. We get a lot of messages here. None of them are bad. Uh, this will happen more and more and more as we use more complex tools where you might get messages that are updates or warnings. If it's not an error, then we're good to go. And we're seeing, hey, this table students does not exist. We drop a table, we create it, so on for all of these. So it looks like all of this worked as expected. And now let's run PSQL and we can use our school database. And the forward slash C is the connect database. Forward slash D I think should give me the lists of um, the different tables. Awesome. And jumping over here, let's talk about joins for a bit. There's something a little bit special about the enrollments table. And I know, is this too small for people to see, by the way? A little for me. Yeah, let me see if I can make it bigger. And if not, we may have to switch to something else. There we go, awesome. Actually, even better. Looks like over here they have. Perfect. And I saw a great question in the chat about um, primary keys. So let's jump back to that. Um, what was the question about serial primary key? I totally did just copy and paste someone else's code. Oh, I had asked um, if it was recommended that for the ID, if we always uh, use serial in front of the primary key. And I was just asking because I had noticed that on for um, some of your IDs, it says like integer primary key instead of serial. Yeah. So I don't know if that was that's, a, that's a great catch. Um, I should have looked over this code a bit more before copying and pasting and running it. Um, what what is the difference between and and to recap what we're looking at here and again the white space doesn't matter um, you will see a lot of sql uh written out like this for readability is we have the name of the column the type of the column and then like constraints and additional information about the column so here the ID is of type serial and here the, it's of type integer. Integer we know, what's the serial type? What does that mean? And iterating in, in the chat, Chris, thank you. Yeah, so serial, just to recap, it is an integer. And then what happens is the database takes care of the work of creating like a new value, like a for loop where we have, you know, we're incrementing the counter I by one. Serial is basically a helper function that we're getting so that every time we create a new table, the ID is just like one, two, three, four, five, and that value keeps getting incremented and each, excuse me, each row in the table gets a new ID. Um, most of the time I would recommend using serial. Kayla, that's a great question. There might be cases where you want to create a primary key and you want to specify what that is. But to be honest, even like a good example is email. We need to enforce an email to be unique. Uh, we could uniquely identify a student a row in the students table by that email address because we really don't want two different people to have the same email. Nonetheless, it is still really nice to have an integer ID, unique ID um, for our students table, especially when we reference it in other places. So I would say using serial probably does make sense most of the time. 
Um, and in fact, it might make sense to do it here and here. I saw a mention about uh, something with the seed data and, and th there could have been an issue there why we didn't do that. Uh, we might end up changing this back as we build this out more. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, what else is on people's minds? And Eric, serial worked fine when I put it in the seed data. Cool. Yeah. Should we just change these back to serial right now for uh, these integers? We might come back to that. Yeah, let's do it. It'll make our lives easier. Um, and I'm going to do a quick find operation and search for integer and make sure it's not anywhere I don't want it to be. And we should be good. And now the nice thing about this drop table step here is that we haven't put any data yet in the database. And in fact, I'm going to go to another tab in my terminal so I don't have to keep exiting and reopening uh, psql. And I'm going to navigate to where that code is. And on the command line, there's a great, if you do control R, it searches through previous commands and I can use the up and down arrow. And we're just gonna run this command again. And we didn't get any errors. We should be good. Um, if I do forward slash D, I think enrollments might've been one. So we get some really interesting information about the enrollments table with that forward slash D. We see the columns in the table, the type of value of those columns, some rules about constraints, and then there's some information about default values here. And this is like Postgres under the hood telling us this ID column is an integer field, but we are taking care of increasing the value of it every time. And what is special about that enrollments table? Uh, and great question, the serial is what creates that sequence function, correct. And like right here with student ID, which is also an integer, we, we don't see that at all. And in fact, we can take a look at some other um, tables here, which might be nice. Like we can look at addresses, um, very similar again. We can look at classes. If we look at the list of tables, we also see this thing here called a sequence. And I don't know exactly what that is, but what it is doing is Postgres is using itself. It's using the database to help keep track of certain things. And so that's why we see those put in here and here. And I'm pretty sure that has to do, since I see the word sequence with um, handling the auto incrementing of our ID primary keys. So what's kind of like the interesting thing about the enrollments table here? It's using the student ID and class ID um, from the students table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I don't have, um, maybe we should throw some seed data in there. And in fact, I think someone had suggested that and that's probably a great idea. Um, so I'm going to do that really quickly. I think I'm just going to copy all of this stuff. Cause then we can play around with it, which will be really nice. And I'm, I am going to be a little lazy. I'm just going to do it right here. See data well. And we're going to paste it. And I'm just going to kind of trust that this works. And can someone remind me on the command line, how do I feed that seed data into my database with, with psql? Is it like this? Does this look about right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. 
what I figured, but it never hurts to check. And again, we get a bunch of messages. We don't see any errors. We should be good to go. And now over here, I can do select star from students if I spelled it right. And by the way, in PSQL2, you can use the up and down arrows to go through your command history, which is really nice. And that one looks good. And I'm just gonna do this very quickly for each table, make sure that all that data got inputted the way we want. And we're looking good. Um, and this enrollments table is kind of the interesting one to look at because it is I have too many tabs open. A student enrolled in a class. And Jim, exactly like you were saying before, the way we track these relationships is with primary keys that we almost always call ID. So what's the primary key of the student's table? ID. Yeah. Um, What's the primary key of the classes table? Also ID, I, I should just answer myself there. Um, what's the primary key of the enrollments table? ID. Yeah, so, and then these guys are, what do we call these again? Student ID and class ID. Uh, foreign keys? Yeah, you got it, exactly. Um, because it's the primary key to something else. And now is probably a good time to start writing some queries. Select star from students where ID equals one. Um, I'm really excited to start using like joins and, and connecting tables. But I know like we wanted to go over some of the select queries from yesterday. So let's do that now. What are some queries that we want to write? And let's, let's if, if it's possible, maybe just tell me what the query is in plain language and then we can build it here. So not like the specifics of like where ID, but like what it's doing. What if you to show where the name begins with a specific letter? Awesome. Let's find all the students whose name begins with the specific letter. And it is really helpful to be able to do that description because first of all, a lot of the times in a technical interview, you'll want to do that. And second of all, as our programs and databases get more complex, we want to be able to think about and talk about and describe the stuff that we want to do without having to get into the implementation details because sometimes we now want to start like architecting and thinking and planning about stuff. When you're doing queries, do you have to have like the select and from in all caps? Great question. You don't, not at all. That is, oh, man. Um, yeah, great question. That is a convention. Um, and it is a good one because it makes it really easy to read when you're writing SQL code, like that's getting saved to a file, you should do that. Um, I, I probably will not be successful at, at following that convention, typing it out here just because it, it's a lot faster not to. Um, but no, that is honestly a, a great question, especially because Python is kind of unique in that it's a language where white space matters. Um, and that's not true with SQL. Um, so I remember there's like a like operator. Is that gonna help us here? Is that gonna get us like where the, do we need to care about if the letter is in the name or that the name starts with it? Adam, there's no column with, uh, with the name Nando. I'm sorry, say that again, yes? There's no, there's no column with a name name like you mentioned earlier. Got it. Got it. And, and in fact, I think what I'll do actually, 
let's make a queries file. Um, let me make sure I know how to comment. And Jim, you were saying uh, get student whose name do we want starts with or contains? Uh, I know the regex for the starts with. I don't know that I know the regex for contains. Got it. Who starts with? A specific letter. Yeah. And you'll often see this, you know, written like this with the tabs. Um, so we've got the first name. So we, we care about their first name, starting with some letter. And oops. sorry about that. That's my Vim being weird. So did someone get this query working yesterday? I didn't, but I think that your like keyword would be the right way of going about it. And then using the um, the percent sign inside of like the, the quotes in the string letter. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a like, and then you just do single quote percent sign and then whatever character you're searching for awesome yeah and let's let's check it out too which is like when i'm not sure like i knew that i wanted to use like but i'm not sure if it's behavior so i'm gonna do a google and check it out and i see Jaden. thank you for the guide code i might borrow that in a sec as well um Yeah, and it looks like it's doing some regex. Percent sign matches any sequence of zero or more characters. Underscore matches any single character. Something like pattern. We can also do not like, which is pretty cool. So I don't think we have to do that right now. So yeah, let's try. Um, let's try it out. First name. Like. Uh, first off, let me go to the students. And look at their names. We've got someone with the T, an E, a J, an L, and A. So that's great. So let's try the T. Where name is like T. Excellent point about lowercase. And I think we'll get there in a sec. So I've got this query. I've got it in this queries file. Um, let's see if this works. I'm just going to run it like this on the command line. Capital That's letters the, make a difference. Say that again. Capital letters make a difference for the first names. Yeah. Yeah. Um, upper first name like T. Yep. And if we go back here and change this, this probably won't work. Yep. And I like that approach. Um, as always, with everything related to strings and handling input, um, there's two ways. Like, honestly, it's probably a bit better to like lowercase everything because it doesn't make a big difference. I'm just used to thinking of that as like a default and uppercase as something special. Let's see if that works. So that does work. Whether it's all uppercase or all lowercase, though, that's um, like we do want to handle that case. So that's awesome. Um, how do people have questions about some of the behavior of what this query is doing? Uh, Chris, 
great question about percenti. What would that do? What's the difference between this and this? Uh, that means it'll begin with T, and then if it, at least in my understanding, and then the percentage before that would be like any T, T located anywhere in the string. Correct. Yeah. I think the percent sign is like SQL's version of a wild card. This says a first name that has T somewhere inside of it. And let's see if this works as expected. And we still get Tiana. Um, if we change this to A, I think we would get a couple names because we get a bunch of people whose name is in there. Um, so that's a, that is definitely a really good thing to notice. And that was one of the reasons too, Jim, like when you threw this out there, why I asked some clarifying questions around that. Um, and so like, it's only one line of difference and we'll use A here, but it makes, a huge difference, right, in terms of like the behavior of the function and, and the output that we get. Um, what if we wanted to get a student whose first or last name contains a letter? What would that query look like? What would I have to modify here to make that happen? Just throw an or in there and copy paste the lower just yeah. just copy paste the where basically and change first name to last name uh, yeah with the in between it so i love it and what i'm going to do is look at the list of students it looks like andre rohan would show up there with an a what I really need, so this is, I'm not writing like tests, I'm not doing test driven development, but this is kind of borrowing from that philosophy to really make sure this code is working correctly. I need to like test it with some data so that I can confirm we're seeing something that we wouldn't otherwise see. So Andre's a problem because he has A in the first and last letters there. Um, I think, yeah, E is a tough one. Elda Sipes. So there's an S in her last name and not in her first name. Um, and I'm just going to comment these out just to keep um, the output more readable. So if we see Elda Sipes show up here, then we know that um, we are grabbing last names as well. And cheated, which is awesome. So that's like, even though we're not writing tests, you can start thinking about a sort of like test-driven development style. And that's a great thing to do and talk about doing out loud like I am now in technical interviews as well. Um, what is another query? And then maybe we take a short break or just keep going and look at joins. And uh, I just wanna say that I appreciate the chat. I just now made the Lord of the Rings connection with the name Andre Rohan. That's awesome. So I have a question. Um, yeah. Would we commonly reduce a data set based on a SQL query or reduce a data set based on a condition inside of our code? Great question. The short answer is both. Um, like Zainab was saying the other day, like at a big company uh, with a like a database containing a large amount of data, like used by multiple departments. Again, I'll use AMC theaters as the example, the database that contains all information everywhere about all their theaters and movies showing and stuff. Um, it would be common to have like stored procedures, which are like a function um, or like there might be queries, even if it's not a stored procedure, but you probably don't want to touch that query because maybe it's been been tuned. And so with a stored procedure, like 
I, I haven't written a ton of stored procedures, but they're basically like functions. Like imagine taking this logic and sticking it in a function so we can pass the letter that we want to get as an argument. And Zainab, it, is that kind of in the ballpark at least for stored procedures? Um, could you could you repeat the last part? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, and 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 sorry and and sorry to totally ask for help there out of the blue. Um, no. I know you you have a couple things you're looking at. Um, with the stored procedure, this would effectively like we could wrap this up in a function and pass in the letter that we wanted to get as an argument. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, Adam, I think another good example might be on that. Let's say you had a billing routine that you didn't want to run until the end of the day. So every night you could run a store procedure that looks for everybody who had new bills or new uh, balances or balances by the, at the end of the day, you process those balances all in one, one swoop. Yeah, exactly. Um, store procedure procedures are used a lot in um, like bulk jobs. So jobs that run overnight, jobs that run like once a day, once a month, whatever it needs to do. Um, yeah, those are- Maybe a synchronization things. task or a replication task. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, totally. And sometimes you will get data from a query, like Django queries the database to get information about a user or a bunch of users. And then maybe you do do more filtering in the Python code um, because it's easier because it's more specific to the task, like the database, you generally, I think like with stored procedures, keep it pretty general. Sometimes it's just, there's kind of a programming principle where you wanna think about like the deeper sort of into the layers of the program that you get, the less you want those parts to change because everything else depends on them. Um, that's actually where the term shell comes from, by the way, it like protects the operating system. It's the shell around the kernel. And um, so the database is kind of right at the heart of things. So if I'm doing stuff for like the website with user data, like it might just be easier and to filter some data that I get from an SQL query in like my Python code that like made the SQL query. Um, and also if I'm using a stored procedure or an SQL query used by like a dozen other classes, then that way we don't have to like touch this code on which a bunch of other code depends. That's that's a great question. Um, and I'm catching up on the chat a bit, and there was a request to write a query for, um, and Jason, thank you, all of Tiana's enrollments that she hasn't yet received a grade for selected by her first name, not her student ID. Um, how does this one sound to people? Is this a good one to, to tackle? Cool, let's do it. Um, and Zach, I saw, I think you had a solution and I may borrow that in a minute, um, but I'm gonna go through it stepwise. So honestly, the first thing like, and this is what you'll want to do more and more, especially like when we start writing web apps and you start messing with CSS, but also with queries like programming, the, the way to write a program and learn stuff is really to experiment. Like let's take advantage of the fact that we can query the database and make experiments. Let's start with something really simple. Let's get all the enrollments. We got a bunch of IDs. Um, I see that Tiana's ID is one. So that's good to know that that's her ID. Um, let's get all the enrollments. Let's just get, yeah, let's just get all the enrollments. And now we do have to probably do a join to make this happen. Yep, and I see inner join mentioned. Um, I'm just gonna start with um, enrollments. And in fact, it might make sense to join on students. We, we could do it either way. Um, 
I'm starting with enrollments because I think that was the first word in, in the sentence that Jason shared. But to be honest, that might not be the best way to do it. Um, but let's get this going. Select star from students, join enrollments on enrollments.studentsid equals a typo here equals students.id and the truth is that this is a big enough query where I don't want to prototype it anymore um, in there I thought uh, I thought we would be doing a little more prototyping but we probably will to like make sure the important thing is like we know Tiana's ID, it's one. And in fact, I would just probably put that here, Tiana ID is one, because we can use that to help make sure that our code is correct. And now that I am using an editor, I am gonna be a little obsessive about um, like casing on enroll, join student on enrollments, join students on uh, yeah, I don't know if this is really. The best way to, to write this out, join students, it probably should look a bit more like this. I think that's a bit more readable. You can kind of go top to bottom. So we're getting everything from the enrollments table joined on the students table. Um, and I think I'll share a good diagram for this in a, in a sec. Um, the on is kind of the key part of a join because it says like where the two parts link. And to go back to our visual aid here, we're saying, get everything from each of these tables, enrollments and students, make the link, join the two tables where this ID, sorry, where this ID, student ID, matches this ID here. And in fact, I wish there is some way to indicate that this is a foreign key. I think you drag you drag the the dot to wherever it needs to attach itself. So when you hover over, no, not there. Um, when you hover over a student, there was. Uh, oh, that's weird. There were dots earlier that. Yeah, I think you have to select the table. Like, click on the table there. Oh um, God! Thank you, thank you guys. Yeah, let's. There we go, one to one. So what kind of relationship is this? Um, how many, can a student have more than one enrollment? Yes. Yes, agreed. So this is a one to many relationship. A student can have many enrollments. Um, and we will keep adding more stuff later, but it's kind of fun to build it up stepwise. And now we can also go ahead and run this query. And I will say it, I do enjoy, and if you're on a Mac, it might be worth getting iTerm, but you can do this with the terminal. You can do this in the VS code terminal as well. Um, I'm just very used to using a, a separate terminal program because I find it a little easier, but it's really personal preference. But I do think it's nice to write as queries get more complex, write them like this and then use the command line to run them. There's also VS Code extensions to do that. Um, let's see here, column students.name does not exist. That is a classic error to make. We have a first name, not a name. And so this looks good. I think we're good. Like. Let's clean this up a bit. Um, 
what's the stuff that we care from the enrollments? We care about enrollments.id. We care about students.first name. Um, we probably care about the class ID and we probably care about the grade. And in fact, depending on the order that we put this in, um, I think that will affect the order that it's displayed in. Let's see if that works. So that's much easier to read, which is awesome. Yeah, that was that was a great one, folks. Um, the next step is to add class name. Absolutely. Um, there's also a nice shorthand that um, SQL gives us because once you start writing out select queries and you start joining multiple tables, this does start to get very wordy. So we can create an alias just the same way like you could assign the value of a variable to another variable. And as long as I haven't gotten this wrong, this should work. Um, I might have to change the rest of the query. Yeah, and in fact, notice that the error message helped me out. Perhaps you meant to refer reference the table alias E. This is where SQL, because it's a very limited language, gets kind of strict. Now that I created this alias, I have to use it in the whole query because that is how SQL is understanding it. So whether this makes your SQL more readable or not, I think really depends on the size of the query and personal preference. Um, but I wanted to point that out. And I actually, I'm curious, does this make this more or less readable for folks? Also, they don't have to be single character aliases. No, they don't. They, they totally don't. That's an excellent point. Um, and in fact, it's, yeah, it, it, single character aliases is not the best. I don't know a good shorthand. I guess we could do like students. It's, it's, it's tricky because it's like, it's almost better to just spell out the full thing rather than a shorthand that's right in the middle. Um, actually, I think I'll just leave this. I think what I'll do is I'll just do it for enrollments as an example. Um, I'll just leave it because it's actually not that bad to read. And let me make sure that the query runs again. On um, oh, because I have it as. Let's see if that works. There we go. Awesome. Um, yeah, this helps a lot when the queries get bigger, uh, which they might. So the next step was to add the class name. Yeah, I like it. Let's add the class name. And so, by the way, I noticed in the chat that like one person shared. Um, some example code that mentioned, I, I think, inner join. And I didn't specify a join at, at all. Um, I just showed like join. So like, let's see what is the default Postgres join. And we should talk very briefly about the different kinds of joins, I think, because that is a good one. Um, though maybe we do that by we we talk about the classes. And I may have to do a Google. I have on the other computer, I found some great um, join diagrams. I put a link in the chat that I think is a really good one. It's the oh. Rebel Labs. Oh, um, not that is that sqltutorial.org oh i see it thank you yeah and if you can throw that in the resources channel that would be great oh this does look great the diagrams i love yeah um and and by the way a quick 
Google search tells us um, their tutorial on joins, but it tells us that inner is the default join behavior. So we can just say join. Um, and actually, I'm going to do a quick image search because I did find a couple images yesterday that I really liked. Um, I liked that one. I like the one that you found, Jim, as well. Um, I liked this one a lot, too. So the circles here kind of represent tables. Uh, and I guess it's Halloween and they're trying to give us ads. And, and this tells us kind of the behavior of like the different kinds of joins when we combine things together. And I don't know a ton of math. I do know that this comes from the idea of sets. And a set is just a fancy word. And, and people who know more math than me will not like me saying this, but a fancy word for a collection of stuff. Um, and this is the other one that I also really liked because I think it, it illustrates it very well and has like queries here. And I'll share these links. Um, this cheat sheet I also think is great because it has a bunch of utility functions as well. So we just did an inner join on enrollments and students where we found the overlap between those two groups. Um, a left join, I think, would give us all the enrollments and the students that match, which isn't really useful for our needs. Uh, the inner join is sort of the default one. And I think there was a good question about like, when do I use the other joins? And I think we'll, we'll try to come back to that. So I think we're making good progress. And Jim, this looks like a great resource as well um, that you shared in the chat that I'm bringing up just now. I also would recommend um, we should start sharing uh, favorite VS code extensions because by far the best way to like get good messages about syntax errors or typos in the SQL we write is going to be by using our, our text editor. And I know there are a couple of good plugins for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, inner join, default join. We use inner join so much that it's just the, the default. And so I think the next join that we were talking about doing was getting the names of the classes that Tiana is in. Is that right? I'm taking that as, as, as a yes. Yes, uh, yes. Awesome. Yeah, and in fact, I should... Let me kind of move this around to put enrollments in the middle. So we've got students. And I'll talk about this enrollments table in a sec. So what's the other foreign key here in the enrollments table? And, and someone tell me what it is and, and what its relationship is to the, the table that it references. Class ID and classes. Yeah, totally. And Eric, thank you as well. And, um, and what kind of art to get the dots? So what's the relationship here? Is it one to one, one to many? Like, uh, Chris, talk me, talk me through it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm eating, but uh, oh. uh, I guess this one would be uh, one to one um, because there's only one class per ID. Although in the enrollments, you can have more than one class. So I'm not sure how that breaks out. Right, it's a good question. Right, on, enro on enrollments, represents a student enrolled in one class, can you have more than one student enrolled in a class? Yes. Yeah. And it does get tricky. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. one to many can have many students enrolled to the class. And, and it is tricky. And it does get tricky to think about it, like kind of from both directions. And that's where I think being able to have like a plain language description is really helpful. And not to put the teaching hat on too much, but when problem solving or designing a problem or doing a programming problem, working with a really simple example with real data is by far the best way to start exploring the problem space. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So one class can have many enrollments. 
Um, is there a mechanism to synthesize an ID in that if you were to combine student ID and class ID together and I see what you're saying. And, and the answer is yes. You, I think you're kind of saying, hey, like a student, if I, if I, Adam, enroll in a class, we only want one record for that in the database. Like I shouldn't be able to enroll myself in the same class twice. And because of that, student ID and class ID together form a unique way of identifying a row in our enrollments table. And here I think is where um, sheets might be useful. Though we could also, let's see if we do select star from enrollments. Let's see if this is useful. This is, yeah. It's a little hard to look at it this way. So I'm going to make a sheet. Um, an enrollment has an ID, a student ID, a class ID, and a grade. So, and again, I apologize. My computer is being a little slow. So we've got an enrollment, an enrollment. ID, student ID, class ID, right. and let me go ahead and fix this. Yeah, Jim, that's a great question. And the term where we're going with this is it's called like a composite key. Um, I'm going to give myself, well, this is actually Kiana because she's student ID number one, uh, sorry. And she's enrolled in uh, and in fact, I'm going to use the query that we just wrote. Tiana is enrolled in class ID number two, which is history. Um, and I'm just gonna give her an A. We'll, we'll, we'll not worry about her actual grade at the moment. Um, and let me go ahead and make this a little more visual. Beautiful. So we don't want this. We don't want Tiana to be enrolled in the same class twice because that's confusing we're losing the integrity of our data, the referential integrity of what's referencing what, and how would we know which grade is the correct grade? Um, what this also means is that effectively, the student ID and the class ID uniquely identify any row in the enrollments table. And can someone maybe explain to me why that is? Why did the student ID and the class ID uniquely, uniquely identify any row in the enrollments table? Because one person can't be in more than one class. Yeah. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be in the same class more than one time. Exactly. Yeah, this is exactly it. Um, yeah. So the term there is a, a, a composite key or like a composite primary key. I think I think that's the correct term. I want to say that that's correct, the correct term. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll probably add that to our schema in a moment. But is there a benefit to doing that, or is it just better to let the keys auto assign? You almost always want uh, like a serial auto incrementing primary key um, because it makes life a lot easier for referencing other tables. And honestly, if something goes wrong, which it always does with real world data, having a, a serial primary key makes life a lot easier. Um, we probably do want in our database 
a rule that says like, hey, I can't enroll in the same class twice. Um, and that might involve like the instruction, the construction effectively of a, of a composite key. Like we're going to be creating a, a database constraint there. Um, and I might have to do a Google search actually to figure out the, syn the syntax of that. I'm curious if anyone looked into that and can maybe help me get that process rolling. Yeah, let's do it. So Postgres uh, constraints unique. And thankfully, the internet was built by programmers and, and programmers Google the most. And so not surprisingly, like once you start learning how to throw the keywords in, you kind of can get to the answer very quickly because this is what we want. We want a unique constraint for multiple columns. Um, so we'll look at how to do this and then I'll talk about how to be careful about changing an existing schema now that we have data in there. And so the way that I research stuff, by the way, like once I find a resource that looks like it's pretty good, I just start skimming until like I find the answer and it looks like it's right here. Um, what I would then do, to be honest, is I would probably Google like Postgres unique constraints because now I think I know how to do it, but I want to make sure I understand it a little bit better. Um, and if it was in class, I would take a little more time and, and reading it, but because I'm, I'm teaching right now, I'm, I'm not going to, but I just kind of want to walk through the process of how to do this, because this is honestly how I think like a huge amount of the learning that you do as a, as, as a programmer develops. And right here, we have a great example, a unique constraint on multiple columns. Um, there's some more things you can do with this with like indexes and finding things that we don't really have to worry about. Um, but we're, we're good for the moment. Like what we can save for enrollments is, and I have to look at the syntax again, unique. And this is shorthand for unique constraint, um, student ID. And you can use the up and down arrows to move through those autocomplete options, as well as the control N and control P keywords and do that. However, I probably don't want to add this to the schema and then like rerun this whole create schema file again. Why not? Because you already have information in the database. You wouldn't want to delete the database. Yeah, exactly. Like the way we'd been doing it before, um, where I would run this command, which I'm not going to run. Control R, by the way, gives you search on the command line where you start typing and you see your command history. That would drop all the tables and all their data. Um, and that would be bad. Um, honestly, when you're developing something new, you also have a seed data file because it's way easier to usually just drop the database and reload the data. So we actually could do that right now. Now that I gave this long speech about why we shouldn't do that, I forgot that we have our seed data. And if I wasn't teaching right now, that is honestly what I would just do. I would just drop the database and rerun, like I would just rerun the schema, blow away all that data and reload it with seed data. Um, what I'll give a quick preview of and what we're going to see like Django has a much more sophisticated way of doing this is what's called a migration where, because we're looking at a real database in production, we can't just blow stuff away. Um, and the command in question is alter table. Um, Eric, that's a great question. Um, Postgres and other databases all have like export commands um that will export the data in a structured fashion the question was is there a simple way to create a seed data file from an existing database um there is a relatively simple way but you wouldn't want to do it because if the database already exists with real data it is probably also being used seed data is really more for prototyping and testing 
um, alter table enrollments. And now I have to Google the alter table, Postgres. And I need to make sure how to do this. But this is exciting. And then we'll finally get to the joining of the two tables and it's noon. So I think that's like perfect timing for us to, to wrap it up from there. And again, like I need to skim for what I want. In fact, I'm just going to search for constraint. Um, add table constraint, alter constraint, drop constraint, alter column. That looks like about right. And now, in fact, I think I'm probably just going to Google Postgres alter table column add constraints. And in fact, I might as well just Google add unique constraint because that's exactly what I want to do. Um, and, you know, I kind of knew this was what it was like intuitively because this, this is how a lot of this syntax works, but it never hurts to do a little research to make sure that we've got, that we're on the right path. So let's try this and see if it works. Alter table enrollments, add unique. And let me get rid of this so we can see. So we've added this SQL. Um, how, once we, successfully make this migration, how can we test that it works? Put your whole enrollments table. Say that again, Icarus. Look at the whole enrollments table. We can look at the table, um, assuming that a student isn't enrolled in two classes at the same time, will that, oh, I see what you're saying. We can examine the schema, totally. That's a very good point. Yeah, I was actually thinking of something else, but that is a great call. And, and we can do both. So let's try this with migrations. Um, we did get an error here. So this is interesting. It looks like there is a student who may be enrolled in the same class twice. Let's take a look at that enrollments table. Um, and honestly, I'm just gonna visually, actually, just, yeah. What about a student that like retakes it? Um, maybe that's what it's talking about. Looks like it's. So that's an excellent point about retakes. And that actually raises a really good point. Like maybe we don't want to add this constraint because how would we handle someone retaking a class? Which I honestly had not thought about at all. Um, so this is actually a good teaching moment and part of the reason why people are kind of conservative about changing database schemas, because I think you're right that that would cause a, a problem and it looks like ID, ID 12. Yeah. So student ID four has enrolled in class ID one twice. And it looks like they got an A, but are taking it again. I, I'm kind of inferring the class isn't over if there's no grade. So it would make more sense if they got like a D and we're taking it again. But um, in any case, thank you for bearing with me. This was a good journey, even though it looks like we now probably don't want to do this. Um, and in fact, I will add a comment here. We don't want to do this because for a student to retake class, they might enroll in the same class twice. And folks also putting on the teaching hat, if when I was talking all about how we don't want students to enroll in the same class twice, some of you were thinking, yeah, but what about if they need to retake it and we're just kind of sitting on those thoughts. That's a great example of why like good engineering teams have like very open discourse because this stuff is complicated and like the good ideas come from everywhere. Um, 
so on that note, let's let's wrap this up and then we can we can take lunch. And I think we're like almost there with this joint that we want to make. Um, I think the most important thing I want to mention is this enrollments table. Like we have a term for tables like this. We call it a join table because it really is tracking the relationship between two different things, between students and classes. It has some extra information here too about grades, but um, it, it also is functioning as a join table. So going back to our queries, where are our queries? I think the last thing that we wanted to do was, um, oh yeah, I didn't get the part about that she hadn't yet received a grade for. Um, so now let's do this. So we need to filter where enrollments.grade, uh, let's see if equals null works. And then we also need to man, let's see if I get this join statement right. So I need to take my own advice here and do this in steps. Let's start by running the query again um, to see if I got the filtering of, of the grade right for Tiana. And I just ran the code I didn't want to run but I also had it commented out, so it should be fine. So that isn't quite working. It looks like I have a syntax error where enrollments.grade equals null. Um, can anyone tell me, is this supposed to be like is? It's supposed to be is because um, in SQL, null has no, um, you, can't, you can't use the equal or greater than for null. Yep, thank you. Let's try that again. I had two errors there. I was doing equals null, and I also had the where statement twice. And now we have to do a join. And can someone tell me, is this the right path in terms of how to do multiple join statements? Does this look right to people so far? Yes. Can someone maybe finish this off for me. What do we, what do we need to do here on line 33 to join the enrollments with the class? Enrollments ID equals class ID. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I understood exactly what you meant. And we I should also get double check. Excuse me. And let's put the class name before the grade. Let's see if this works. Ah, so I do have a typo. SQL errors really are great on enrollments.classID. I think it was classes ID, right? I can't remember. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Um, there has to be a VS Code plugin that would give me a syntax error for that, by the way. Um, I might have to do a little setup because it would have to know about the schema file, but that that's a very, I, I'm sure that exists. Let's see, missing from clause for table class. Same problem. On line 28. Oh, the class dot name. Thank you so much. Uh, that's also a great example of where the alias can work because I am terrible at remembering those things and using an alias makes it a little easier. So now, now we're cooking though. Now we have Tiana's class, Spanish, uh, where she has not yet received a grade. And we've done a join on two tables. We've used uh, inner joins. We've built a really nice entity relationship diagram of uh, three of the critical tables. And uh, this has been really cool. Um, I want to say we have more review time tomorrow to go over more SQL stuff. 
Um, and then I know there are some assignments to work on this afternoon. So I think we'll be able to have like a very healthy dose of SQL, which, which will be great because what we'll be doing next is we'll start looking at some libraries that Django has um, that do a lot of the work of writing the SQL for us and let us use like Python classes and objects to kind of interact with the database from our, our Django code. But this is like the foundation and SQL isn't going anywhere. So it's super valuable stuff to know. Um, so folks, thank you so much. Um, we should break for lunch. I really appreciate you sticking around. And if there are questions that people have that we didn't have a chance to get to or that I missed, um, throw them in the question stock. We, we've, we've been using it a little, but not a lot. Um, throw it in the doc and, and, and I'll, I'll take a look at it and, and, and see what SQL related questions we have. Um, and of course we'll be on, on Slack and, um, Today is a pairing day. So I think that's something that we're gonna want everyone to do because we do think that that's really helpful and we'll get you the pairs over lunch. And how does coming back at like 1.30 sound to everyone to dive into pairing for the day? Awesome. Thank you folks. Have a great lunch and see you in the afternoon.